this will be it. Now, Andrew did say that I could talk on whatever I wanted to talk about, and uh, I did get my first chickens this year. So this talk is mostly on uh, my first year with chickens, and uh, if, if you don't know, that's what an egg looks like. So anyway, enough of stupid jokes, and uh, we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> maybe. So, maybe. There we go. Okay. So, all right, maybe I'll stand over here, and I can kind of see... And uh, if I need to talk louder, just, just tell me to talk louder. So um, anyway, this is our store and uh, just a, a beautiful picture that Lynn took of a bee and uh, just kind of a pretty picture. But uh, I started uh, when I was, everybody, the question always is, right? How did you get started in bees? Why did you get interested in bees? Well, I was kind of a strange little kid at about six. I would get up Saturday morning at like six in the morning because the farm show was on, the USDA. They, they had, you know, planning stuff and all this other stuff. And so instead of watching cartoons right away, I would watch that. And uh, one week they had a thing on beekeeping. And I said, wow, as a little kid, that's, man, that is neat. So then later on, I went to like Boy Scouts, but it was Christian Service Brigade. It was in the church. And uh, every week they'd have a captain special and a guy would come in and he'd talk about a different subject, his hobbies or whatever. And now I was probably 14 and a beekeeper came in and told us all about bees. And it's like, whoa, that's, it re-sparked me onto bees. And then I used to go to the library and read stuff on bees. And then uh, I got married, I moved to New York State. My first wife bought me two packages of bees. So that's how it started. Um, I still have the bees, I don't have that wife. Um, but uh, anyway, I had bees for a year or so, two years, and then I asked the New York State Bee Inspector on, if I could go out with him to see what a bee inspection was. So he was more than happy to bring me. Little did I know, it was in August, and the hives were this high, and he I was the bull that day. I pulled all that honey off down to the brood nest. He would check the hives, put the brood back, and I'd put the boxes on. And I loved it. I mean, I, this, this was great, right? So go to, I don't know if anybody remembers, Paul Ballard out of Roxbury, New York. He's long since gone, but we inspected one of his yards, and it was up in the woods, and there was just this big opening up in the trees. And it was, it was like a Beautiful day, the bees were just roaring because there was a honey flow and they were all just going up through that hole. And it looked like that, all these little diamonds with a roar. And I knew I was going to be a commercial beekeeper. That was it, right? How could it get any better than that, you know? So, anyway, um, I married my wife Karen in uh, 96, right? <laughs> I want to introduce my wife, Karen, if you'd stand up. I know I'm going to embarrass you, but that's too bad. So, um, she's the reason I'm where I'm at, because she never said, no more bees. You can, you know, I wanted to split. She never said no. So I think she's getting close, though. <laughs> so uh, anyway, there we are in the bee yards, and I think that's probably South Carolina. Well, no, probably New York State, so anyway, but she had a full-time job, and she would come home from work, and we would pack honey till midnight, or we'd put boxes together on vacation. We would, you know, go to South Carolina to work bees or whatever, so she's the reason, one of the biggest reasons for Cutix honey, so anyway. Um, the old days, everything was done by hand. Um, when I first started, we would even load semi-trailers -tra by hand. Uh, that's a job, and uh, that's probably why my back and my knees aren't so good anymore. But uh, yeah, this is uh, loading nukes by hand in South Carolina. Um, that's the first semi-load of nukes we ever shipped, so we were, we were pretty excited about that. And that was out of South Carolina in the spring. Part of bee, you know, part of beekeeping is having your grandkids. That's my uh, grandson Owen. He's he's he likes to be on equipment, so we got a new forklift. He jumped right up on that. This is my granddaughter Lily. Um, she would go and uh, 
actually catch queens and put them in the, that was at age of eight, eight years old, she was catching queens and putting them in cages. Um, Four or five. Oh, 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 she's five there? Yeah. Oh, she's five. <laughs> so, thank you, Lindsay. So, uh, one of the greatest joys I ever had is we're driving home from doing this, and she goes, Grandpa, none of my other friends have dads take them, grandpas take them out to catch queens, you know, like, so that was like, wow, that's uh, one of the best things I got in beekeeping, so, okay, so we, we have our business, we grew it up, and then we divided into five different uh, entities, so we have pollination services, we have cutex nukes and queens, we have Cutex Honey, which packs honey, and our newest addition is Cutex Everything Bees, which is, stand up, Lindsay. Lindsay runs, she's part, partnered with that. She's uh, the, the nukes, and, she's the Cutex Everything Bee, so. And uh, we, we started a store and everything, but it's, it's, it's harder than keeping bees. So it's, it's hard, but we're getting there. She's, she'll do it, so. Uh, so anyway, so we'll, we'll just start a year with the, the pollination service. Uh, the bees go to South Carolina in, well, October, but they're, they're there before Thanksgiving. And we feed, we get them ready, let them sit, we do a mite treatment. And then in the middle of January, we start to get them ready for, for almonds in California. So this is, uh, this is our crew for the pollination side. Um, this, uh, me and my wife, and uh, Shelby, she runs the office. She, uh, she does all the crucial paperwork, e ELAP, and, you know, working to get our guys north, and she's really good at that stuff. So without, without a crew, you can't do anything. So, and things are getting harder and harder to do. So you need good people to do what they need to do, and you can't, you can't be there looking over their shoulder all the time. You just got to trust what they do. So, so we're blessed with good people. So our first, our first pollination here is almonds. So we're going from South Carolina now all the way across the coast to California. And there's what they call a bug station. So our, your semi pulls in, the inspectors come out, and well, you hope they come out right away. They, sometimes you sit there for an hour, but they lift the nets up, they start looking for you know, bugs that they don't have in California. And, and they, We've had one inspector spend over an hour on one side of the truck till she found a high beetle larva, which is allowed in the state, but they have to, and then they have to send a picture to Sacramento. Somebody, and an entomologist has to define, you know, say yes, that's what it is, goes back, and then they may release you. And then this time your bees may have sat in 80 degrees sunshine for three or four hours. So it's, uh, it's very stressful. So if you don't pray before you send bees to almonds, you will be praying because, you know, you got your bees there and you're getting graded on the numbers of bees in the hive per frames of bees. And you can lose a half a frame like that, you know, just sitting. So, so we go through an elaborate procedure to get our bees ready to get through those inspections. So this is just a quick show of what we do. They go up to the pallet of bees. And our bee yards there, we usually have one or two semi-loads, so anywhere from 500 to 1,100 colonies in a yard. So then they, they take the covers off, they lay the covers in front of the hive. Next. Then they, they swing the, the, the colony out on that cover. You can see them doing that. Okay, now we got, now they take that old pallet out of there, because remember, there's cocoons and everything else. We can't, we can't ship those pallets, so they take that pallet away. Then we rake all the debris that was underneath the pallet, we rake that out of there. Then we spread ant poison. There, they're spraying ant poison down underneath. Then we put a cross, remember, it's two by six, cross piece. Then we spray it with diesel fuel. We've we got to try to keep ant, ants. The, the big thing they're after is... Uh, fire ants, but anything, we don't want anything crawling on those pallets. So then we either put a power wash pallet, and we scrape the pallets and power wash them, or we, a lot of times we build new pallets. We set a new pallet down. Now they take and they brush all the dirt off in the hand holes they put their fingers in because that's a great place for a little cocoon to hide, a bug, spider, whatever. 
They brush them all with their hands, get them all clean. Then when they're done getting them clean, they set them up on the pallet. Then we leave the covers off and then we'll feed. And then we'll put the covers on and then we strap them. And that's, that's how we get them ready for California. So it's, uh, you know, everybody sees those big prices for almond pollination, right? But there's a lot of work that goes into getting your bees ready to go if you're coming, especially from a fire ant state. So then what we'll have do, we have the, the South Carolina inspector come out and he does a pre-ant inspection for us. And that allows us to have three or five ant tolerance going into California. So, uh, but, but then you wonder, California says, well, you got that thing. We're going to prove that it's no good. So you don't know whether it's helping you or hurting you. So, but uh, all the times we've gone to California, we've had to have our loads washed twice and never for ants. One was for a leaf beetle, whatever a leaf beetle is. And we're loading these up. A lot of times we're loading them up at late, you know, at night or real early in the morning. You don't know what's flying around going to land on that as you're as you're putting them on the truck and we usually have a guy with a backpack leaf blower blowing off each pallet before it goes on the semi so it uh, it's a lot of work yes do you provide uh, water for them when you travel like that uh, the bees, bees are good I mean we, we just put feed in them um, it's cold going out they, they, ride, they ride really well yeah we used to tell the truckers once in a while, you know, you can hose them down if you want, but I don't really think it's necessary. Sometimes I think it creates too much stress doing that. But uh, on the way back, we'll tell them if it gets hot at night and you're going to pull over at night, spray them down if you can. And you just spray the outside. Just, just spray and get it up on top so it drips down. But, you know, you're relying on truckers. You don't, you know, it's three, you know, 2,800 miles across. You're not sure exactly what's going on all the time, but... <laughs> So you, you try to hire truckers that you trust. You know, you, do, you got $100,000 worth of bees on that truck. So, so then we put them on the truck, we net them. And then uh, I've got a friend, uh, Ryan Cousin, that's a broker. He's out in California. He, he receives the truck, unloads them, and spreads them in the almonds. So I've never been there. I think maybe this year we'll try to get there. I don't know. See if my wife says yes or no, but I'd like to go and at least see the bloom once. So, but uh, they say it's spectacular. It looks spectacular. So, um, and then they uh, some farms you get graded. Some farms you, it's, you know, we go for an eight frame average, um, six frame minimum. So it's got to be at least six frames of bees, and they have to average out at eight frames. So then you get whatever you get. Yes. No, it's just the only state is, is California. And how many days does it take you? Oh, <laughs> legally I think it should take three, but we've had some drivers make it in less than three. So, yeah, I'm not sure they're following the... But, I get, pardon? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, two years ago we had uh, 14 pallets stole out of one yard. So 56 hives. Um, we've had a pallet here and there. Sometimes one hive stole off a pallet. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it, you, you gotta be able to take that stress of, you know, if you're gonna worry about your bees getting stolen, don't go to California. You know, it's just part of the business plan. You know, you just gotta expect, eventually I'm gonna get something stolen. Just pray that the truck they're stealing them with isn't big enough to take you know, 40 pallets. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, 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 you know, some guys, ours go there, they go right into the orchards. So it, it saves us a lot. There's some places where guys send them out early and they, they have winter yards in California and they'll take half a semi load, you know. So it's, it is what it is. There's a, not, not everybody's honest. You know, beekeeping, you always think, oh, what a great group of people. And for, mostly, Everybody is great, you know, but there's always a bad apple, right? So, and, you know, some of these guys have signed contracts. They need bees for those contracts. They lose a whole bunch of bees. Now they're, they're, they're being held to that contract. They need bees, and there they are, you know. So um, I know 
one of the 80s, they had, they had a, an almond grower call them in June and say, when are you going to come get your bees, you know? But somebody had stolen them, rented them, and just left them there. So they didn't even know where they <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, everything has cutic on it. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't stop them. So, yeah, so, um, so. You mentioned how much the local grocery store mentioned how much it costs to get. Oh yeah, the the cost of shipping. Used to cost us like six to seven grand this one way. Uh, you, we didn't send them last the year before we sent. We were up at. I think it was twenty-two thousand round trip. So it was 11 grand each way. So, and I think last year it might have even been more. So it's it's not it's not a sport for the faint of heart. So you just got to accept all these things, and you know get through the border. That's the first thing. Get them out in the orchards without getting any stole, and then make grade. And then coming back, nobody cares. You just load them up and go. So, so but. It's the only place you can make a paycheck in, Jan in February, so that's where, you know. And we, we, need, we need the income because we've got all those employees that like to get paid, you know. I can't blame them. I want to pay them. They want money, too. So it's, you know, it's um, this past year, though, with the price of almonds have gone way down, and now farmers are farming at a deficit, and there's a bunch of guys still waiting for their money from last spring. So if you go, make sure the people you're going with are upstanding and they're going to guarantee a payment. So, long way to go for nothing. Bill that money right to the people that take the cut, right? The, the broker bills them. He takes his cut. Is he the only one representing you there? So yeah. If you in your house, he's not a call? Well, he'll, he'll try to, load, you know, it's, it's like, where are you going to find him in California? They could be 300 miles away, you know. Uh, there's, I think the almonds go over 400 miles, or, or, or at least 400 miles, right? So. You assume the risk. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you just, you know, you, if if you're that tight and you're that worried, you just better pray more, <laughs> or just, you know, you say, oh well, I got 56 hives stole. What am I going to do? You know, it's done, it's done, and just move on. So. It, it's kind of like bears in California, a different way of, you know, instead of bears destroying them, a beekeeper stealing them, so. Anyway, so that's, that's uh, so we did a, oh, this was what, in 2008, seven, 16, 17, or 18, I don't know. Uh, Ginger Z from ABC, or is it NBC? ABC. ABC, uh, the, the, the head news, uh, the head weather girl there, she came down and did a, did a whole series on us migrating our bees to California, back to South Carolina, back to New York. And, and uh, if, if you want to see the whole story, it, just look up uh, Food Forecast, ABC News, Ginger Z, Bee Migration. It's, it's an interesting uh, hour, maybe? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? So. But that was, it's, it's, as a beekeeper, you get to do fun things once in a while. Now, that, that was a lot of fun. So we had a good time. So, so now the bees are out in California. And now the guys in North Carolina are calling. We need bees for our high bush blueberries. So blueberries are my favorite pollination. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to grow blueberries. I never did, but now I'm part of the blueberry industry and in kind of the back door, I guess. But... Uh, now I just love I love to do high bush blueberries, and they're not good on bees, but that shows you beekeepers aren't always as bright as we appear. Sometimes we don't appear very bright either. But anyway, these are the these are the um, blueberry fields up in North mean, Carolina. You mean? <laughs> yeah. So this is this is our truck. It it's uh, I, I love spreading bees with a freight liner because that thing can turn like a pickup truck. Uh, the international, other trucks we got, just it's just a nightmare trying to turn. And there's ditches there that are this deep, you know. And a lot of times we're moving them at night, so it gets a little bit hair raising at times. Um, usually we keep them if we're if we're if we're driving up from South Carolina, then we'll have them strapped and and on load bar and stra and strapped. But uh, 
Normally, if we, we bring a semi in, we unload onto the trucks and we don't strap, we just run them around and, and set them off. So these are just a couple pictures of the blueberries in North Carolina. They're starting to bloom. Are those machine picked? Uh, hand and machine, yeah, yeah. And then, and then the frost comes, right? The frost warning at night, so they turn the sprinklers on and, uh, and they turn everything to ice. And they've got to keep those sprinklers running till it warms up in the morning and the ice starts to fall off the bushes and they can shut the sprinklers off. So it's amazing when you look at, you wonder how anything could live, right? But sometimes they do that two and three times a year to those bushes. I'm sure it's not good for them, but it's better than losing your crop, right? So. So, uh, but it's, it's just, man, when the sun hits all that glitter, that ice, it's just like, oh, it's just beautiful, you know. I'm sure the blueberry grower doesn't think so, but being there, seeing it, oh, man, it's just gorgeous. You can see the, the sprayer's still going in the back. They got to go till, till the ice starts falling off in the morning. What's so, this is, um, oh, when we first started going there, we didn't start putting bees in until March. We put bees in as early as the 6th of February, and that's when you get a lot of this stuff going on. So, so usually by the middle of February, we're starting to put bees in, which is why you can't use bees that are going to California. So, you say you came off? Well, they need them before they get back, because we're not getting the bees back from California till the end of, end of March. So, and then there's the mishaps. So. This was me and my wife, Karen, one morning. We'd, we had driven up from South Carolina. It's about a two and a half hour drive. And uh, normally when we got there, we would pull the net, the straps and everything. And for some reason, I just said, ah, just, we'll just unstrap them as we go, right? So we're going down a road. I mean, we're not even off the road. And one of the drainage pipes underneath just gave way and the truck went boom and boom and off came two pallets. They were the only two we didn't have strapped. So if we had everything unstrapped, there would have been quite a pile of mess. So, so these are just some of the fun things that happen in pollination. So and then uh, you, you tell your, your employees, kind of stay to the, to the left when you come up through there because it's soft in there and they don't, <laughs> you know, in one ear out the other and, and there we are, you know. So, you know, we tried pulling it out with a Hummer B and everything and another truck and the, the grower came by and said, I'll go get my backhoe and he came and pulled us right out. So now the guys will know to stay to the left, see? But I got to make sure the same guys are there next year. So it's up to me to make sure that they know what they're doing. So, but they're good guys. They, they go. And then, of course, we fight bears in North Carolina. Part of our job is fighting bears. So... So that's, and, and I, why I love blueberries in North Carolina is the growers there, uh, they're, just, they're just regular guys. And you know, we form really good friendships. Uh, we'll eat lunch together. There used to be a little diner thing there, but that got flooded with one of those. I mean, it was like up to the top of the roof, the flood. But before that, you'd meet all the growers there and have lunch and joke around and do all that stuff. And they're just good, good guys make, trying to make a living. Um, and then, the fruits of our, the bees' labors and our labors, we got to pick some, some blueberries to take home. So that's always fun. So beautiful, though. I mean, it's just gorgeous there. Do you get much honey? From blueberries? Um, depends on the year. Maybe a little bit, but we're not... We like to make a little bit because after here, we're, we're, some of these bees are going to go to apples or, or um, low-bush blueberries. So... If they can make a little honey, that's good. That's less feeding we have to do. Uh, we, we bring them in as a story and a half, and we put another the story and a half, a, a six and five eighths on the bottom, a deep. And we like that configuration because you can spread your covers apart and all your feeders are right there. And we just pump feed into them. And then towards the end, when they're really getting built up good, we'll put a six and five eighths in box on top. And the queen will jump up in there, but they, they do, sometimes they'll almost fill a box, yeah. But, you know, we got three hives to the acre, so there's a lot of bees, you know, for the amount of bloom. But, now, so 
And blueberries are fun. It, but, you know, there's a lot of fungicides in blueberries. And, you know, I realize when I go there that we're going to get sprayed. But if they don't spray, there won't be a blueberry farm to go to next year. So, you know, it's, they try their best to spray as little or, and, you know, when the bees aren't flying as they can. But you, you, you assume some risk, and they're assuming some risk that your bees are going to be good. They don't want to kill your bees because <laughs> they're the ones pollinating their blueberries, right? So, yeah, so it's a... Uh, and those guys, they, you know, oh, what can we do? You know, they say, oh, what can we do to protect the bees? That, you know, they, they like the bees. They got to like their bees because they got one shot in the spring to get a crop. And if they don't get that crop, it's all next year until you get another crop, so... Yeah, so, yeah, it's a great place to go. Love it. And then we pick the bees back up out of there and take them back to South Carolina. And then we, uh, we start working them to get ready for apples and low bush blueberries. So apples, I, I don't go to apples. I just send my bees there and another guy spreads them. So I think I got about three pictures or four pictures. So this, and sometimes they're spreading the apple bees in, in snow. That was this year, I believe. And uh, it's not like blueberry pollination where you got 18 pallets. You know, it's one pallet here, one pallet over there. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to drop 15 pallets or 20 pallets or 10 pallets. But uh, so I got a guy that uh, he leases them from me. He puts them in and reloads them and sends them back. So we have a good relationship. And the bees always come out pretty good. Sometimes that top six and five eighths will be full of honey when they come out of apples. So we send strong hives. We uh, we don't send mediocre stuff. We send the best we can send because there's this guy's livings depend on our bees. You know, every grower we go to, his livelihood depends on us. You know, so if we don't do our job, shame on us, right? We're bringing those bees. They depend on good bees. We give them good bees. Yes. No, not no, not really. We move, we move, we don't move them when they're flying. You know, we move them early in the morning, late at night, or, or we move them all night long sometimes. No, no, no. But we don't. We we're not rough. You know, we we watch the what. You know, we don't load in the middle of the day and leave a bunch of bees behind and. Yeah, so we, we do it gently and try to do things right. So, I mean, you don't want to leave a bunch of bees for one of their workers to go by and step in them and get stung up. You know, you got to be courteous. You got to be a good neighbor, right? So, but, but they'll come and you get stuck, they're right out there to pull you out. So, you know, then halfway through the season, they say, oh, we need more bees. Can you bring more bees? Sure we can, you know, it's, but... I got one guy that he, he, uh, he used to rent local bees and stuff. And then uh, this was one of the first years we could ever bring bees back from almonds and actually be there in time. He saw those bees. He said, I, he said, I could get my lawyer to sue you because those bees are pulling the bushes out of the ground. <laughs> so they were, they, he never saw such good bees, you know. And so he just, I don't know, we're up over 1,500 hives with one grower down there. So he's, you know, he's sold nobody else's bees but ours. So, and he keeps putting in more acres. So I, I said, you got to retire, I got to retire, but you got to retire first. So I, we're, we're all getting older, all these guys. So anyway, so that's apples. And then our last, uh, our last hurrah for pollination is low bush blueberries. And I don't know if you've ever been to Maine, to the Barrens. It's, it's barren up there, but it's gorgeous. So these, these are, we're loading a load of bees. That's how they go up to Maine. They go up, uh, oh, these are two deeps in a six and five eighths. A lot of times, we'll, most of the time, we just send a, a six and five eighths on the bottom, a deep, and a six and five eighths on top. Um, but we're going back to what we did years ago. We're putting, we're reversing stuff before they go. The deep goes on the bottom, then a two, six, and five eighths. That way, if they do make some honey up there, it's all in six and five eighths frames. So we go through when they come back out of, out of Maine, and we handpick all, all the sealed frames of honey out. We don't make a huge amount of honey, I think. I think this year we might have got 28 barrels. Um, 
few years back we got 52. So it's not like a huge amount of honey, but it's a specialty, really nice honey. Pure Maine blueberry honey, you know, it's just nice stuff. Hmm? K9, but we'll get into that later. Yeah, so anyway, so th this was, we used to bring some bees to New Hampshire for blueberries, that, and this is a New Hampshire yard, and that's, that's how many we put in the location up there. So a lot, lot better than apples, huh? So, and how can you not want to go there and see a view like that? You know, that's what beekeeping's about for me, is we get to travel. Karen and I have spent untold days in trucks together, right? I mean, we, moving bees in Maine, we would start at 7 o'clock at night. We'd see the sunset, and up there, sunrise is like at 3, 3.30 in the morning. We'd see that. Then we'd still be loading semis, and we'd finally go to bed about 9, 10 o'clock in the morning and get up at 2 or 3 and do it all over again, day after day. I think we did 19 semi-loads one time. It wasn't all our bees, but we were loading for other people. So it's, it's tough work, but if it's... it's it's great. I mean, if you love it, you love it, right? I mean, and how could you not love a view like that working bees, right? This is the uh, airfield up in Cherryfield. That's all blue, low bush blueberries. They're only about this tall, you know, it's like a carpet. People go, where's the blueberry bushes? They're right there. <laughs> so, so that's just the carpet of low bush blueberries. That's all the blossoms, and that's the, the end in the fall. In August, that's what they look like. Those bushes are only like this tall. And that, that's how many, how many berries on one little stem. We were loading bees one night, and I broke up a, a blossom, a stem full of blossoms, and I gave them to Karen. I think you counted over 100 blossoms on that one little stem, little tiny stem. So... And that's, that's what they look like. The ground's just blue. So we're probably squishing some, but anyway. Got to take a picture, right, of that. So, and then that's, that's a harvester, a blueberry harvester. You see there's, there's three, uh, these right here are combines. There's, and they come around with their little fork, their little fingers, and they, you know, you, they, 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 uh, they pick those blueberries this year in the fall. They'll burn it down or mow it down. And then the next spring it sends up one shoot. And that's how it grows all summer. And it sets a bloom for the following year. And then they harvest it again. If you, if you didn't mow them down, you'd have little branches coming off that stem. And those combines would just rip them right out of the ground. So that's why they, they do it every... And they... they harvest once. It's high bush blueberries the first time through they hand pick for fresh market and then everything past there is machine pick. But now there are some better varieties they can machine pick for, heart, for uh, fresh fruit. Um, labor is, is everything in blueberries. You can't you know how are you going to get 400 pickers to come and everybody else needs 400 pickers and you know it just goes on and on. So it's just harder and harder to get labor, so machines are taking more and more of the work. So. And then this is uh, skeet shooting in Maine. You got, you know, pull and out runs a bear. So that was, uh, that was one morning we went with the, with the guys, they had snared a bear, because lots of bear damage in Maine. I mean, you know, we, we fight bears in North Carolina, we fight bears in Maine. And um, so, they had snared him, and that bear, I tell you, anything he could reach was just ripped to shreds. No bark left on the trees or anything. So they anesthetized him and put him in a trap and drove him. I think we went 20 or 30 miles, which, you know, the bear will be back in two days or maybe overnight. But anyway, it got him out of there. So, so they always bring a shotgun in case the bear turns on him. But, uh, so I always say it looks like they're skeet shooting. Pull! <laughs> so anyway, so. And then uh, when we're in Maine, we get graded. We go to Cherryfield Foods, and uh, they pay pretty good, but you've got to have good bees again. So to get the top dollar, you have to have brood on 10 frames, deep frames. So, so they go through at a certain point, and they, well, we'll look at that one, that one, that one, you know. And 
kind of by the luck of the draw. You hope there's not a bad one in there, right? A zero. So, but anyway, we usually do. We usually get top dollar, then you get a bonus. So it's it's good. And all those stones are there because they pulled the straps off and they've, uh, you know, until the covers get sealed back down. So, and then uh, we're done. Blueberry, the blueberries are done. So now we're we're bunching all that we we go out. And we bunch bees for a night or two. And this is out on that airfield where we had some bees out that way. So we, we were out at night. We got all those set up. And then the next morning, the semi pulled in right between them. And we just pick up three pallets at a time and set them on the truck. And I think in about an hour and a half, we had the truck. I think it was less than an hour and a half. It was quick. We had them loaded, strapped down. and on the way back to New York for honey for the rest of the summer. So this is the bees getting back to New York. They've been, a, they got a little warm on the way back. It was cool up in Maine in the morning, you know, but, um, so they're, they're good hives. So meanwhile in South Carolina, we, we, this, this isn't now this time of year, but sometimes we actually do get uh, that's ice, not really snow, but that's our queen shed where we used to do all our queen work. Now we have a different place to do it, bigger. And then uh, sometimes just stuff that happens. You get a virgin hatches and gets in your cells and you go to get them and there's nothing left. But that happens to everybody once in a while. And then uh, hygienic testing. We used to do it by ourselves, we tin can, you can see we push it in the comb, we're pouring in the nitrogen and then uh, put it back in the hive, you know, kill, freeze all that brood in that circle, put it back in the hive and 24 hours later you look at it and count how much, what percentage of brood is hatched or been tore out, cleaned up. So that's when we used to do our own hygienic testing. Now we have BIP do it. We do it, we have BIP do it because they feel that we can do it, and people go, yeah, you're doing your own. But if BIP does it, here it is. You know, nobody's lying about this. This is, this is the hygienic testing. So anyway, then we're uh, headed to New York. And uh, that's one of my favorite pictures. It's by the rest area coming into New York State. So good to be back to another spring, right? Or a little bit late spring, but good to be back home. Except for this. <laughs> so, you know, you get some of that in New York. If you, if you don't go to a yard for two or three weeks, you may come back and see that. But, you know, that is what it is. So you pick it up and move on. More and more bears. So then we spread our bees and we put supers on. And this is hopefully they look like this after a while. And I think these yards were up along the St. Lawrence River. So we used to get seven, eight boxes of honey off most of our hives up there. So now it's not like that all the time. <laughs> Another. Then we, then we pull honey. We use fume boards, but we use wind boards. Um, there's burlap down. There's a we take a six and five eighths box and we staple burlap on it. Then we put a little rim wooden rim around that and then we cut a put a board on top cut a hole in and we put a three inch elbow in and you put your spray your bee go on the, or honey robber I bet here I better use honey robber right man lake well we do use the honey robber from man lake um, you spray it on there and you put it on you turn that elbow into the wind and it just drives that drives that fume right down through so then we we load them on Pallets, 24 to a pallet. That's just got an extra box that's going to the truck. And then uh, we got them all four supers high on our pallets. This is what the hives hopefully look like when you pull the last box in the fall. That's an Apivar, Apigard treatment on them. And then we, we take all those pallets of honey, double stack them on our smaller trucks. Well, that's, we call those our smaller trucks. We, we do use, uh, you know, 14 and 16 foot flatbed uh, dodges, but we're getting now that we need the 20, 
22 foot, 24 foot trucks just makes it easier. And uh, then we get back, we have a, all this honey is going to end up back in Norwich, or Oxford. This is up, I think this was up in the St. Lawrence. So we've got a, a yard there that we can get semis in. So we bring all that honey in, and then we put tarp over it and nets so the bees can't get in. And then uh, usually up there we could pull a semi load a day, which is about a little over 1,200 boxes. So then we get a semi in, we load them up, and he's off to Oxford. So here he's pulling into Oxford where our building is. And that's the first, we, we built a new building, a new extracting plant. That's the first semi-load of honey we ever brought in. That was pretty exciting to us that day. <laughs> so they unload it. Now, these are our hot rooms. We have two hot rooms. Each can hold, uh, oh, a little over 3,000 supers in each one. So, And that's a crew of guys that were working for us that year. That's our extracting building and this guy's semi-retired now or mostly tired this is our extracting our new extracting facility which isn't so new anymore but um, that's a honey spinner separates the honey from the wax the wax from the honey so this is uh, the uh, top bar and bottom bar cleaner from Cohen I think this is a video So it's got a wall grind top and bottom that are spinning, and it, it does a pretty good job. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's a lot better than scraping by hand. So then they, uh, then we got, you know, this is our 120 frame system for Cohen. It's our uncapper. Yeah, we make sure that each comb is separated from the others. If you have two go through, it tries to flip, it tries to take both down through and it ends up flipping one over and it makes a mess. So you, okay, anybody that's on that, we spend a lot of time making sure that every comb is separated. And not just the top, you know, sometimes a burr comb can be on the bottom. You still so, need people. What's that? You still need people. You still need people. Good. Yeah, good people, good. not just people. So, and... and uh, the Cohen 120 is all operated by uh, hand, hand controls, operated, you know, air, air pistons, and runs the whole thing. So that's 30 new combs full of honey pushed in, 30 extracted combs pushed out. And then the honey gets extracted, the cappings and the honey get mixed together in a slurry, it goes through a progressive capacity pump over, it goes through a heat exchanger to warm it up to about 100, then we run it through the cook and beals, and it's a spinner type thing, and it, the, wax go, the honey goes to the outside of the, of the reel, the wax is lighter than honey, so it, you know, it floats to the inside, even though it's spinning. And it gets so much in there, you got a spinning knife in there that chips the wax off, and that's, it comes out like sawdust. And then majority of the wax and everything is out of the honey when we pump it up into our big tanks. And then we fill barrels. So we hope we fill a lot of barrels. That's, I think that's about 250 barrels, that one block down there. But in, in a good year, we'll do, four, you know, we'll do 1,000 barrels in a good year, so. But we haven't had a good year in a long time, so. Maybe this year, we're hoping. But, so then, all the honey's off, then we bring the bees back to a bunch yard, and um, we go through them. Sometimes if they're light, we'll feed them. They get uh, a patty on them. Sometimes a mite treatment, depending on what we're finding. We got a crew going through them. And then we load them up. We can do a lot of loading in, at days in New York in the fall because it's cool. And there's two semis loaded and headed to South Carolina. 
just as easy as that. And then they made it South Carolina, and now we're unloading them in yards in South Carolina, and that's pretty much a year in the bees with Cutix. So, so that's the... No, this, this is splitting bees down South Carolina. Just an extra photo we threw in, right? Is there any more? Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the Cutix pollination service part. So uh, we've, we've packed honey since 1979. So this is the crew that packs the honey, does the office work, and pitches the honey. And that's our different varieties that we pack. So we pack a pretty good variety. At this stand, I think we built in the early 90s or late 80s. Self-service. People will come across the country and they'll have to stop here because that's part of their trip is we're going to stop at Cutex Honey Stand. And it's all self-serve on our system. And we keep pretty good track. And some days we're 30 bucks ahead. And some days we're 50 bucks behind. But overall, you, you would think we'd get ripped off every day. But I just, you know, God, I think God watches over us. And, now you don't steal that stuff. We had one guy that was drunk that went off the road up the road and he had stopped and stole like six five pound jars of honey. And the cop goes, where'd those come? And he says, oh, I stole them off the stand. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> just crazy things, you, you know, life is always interesting and, and sometimes it's good to be able to laugh at stuff, you know. It, uh, like my philosophy in business is, you know, God owns everything, right? He owns, he owns all this stuff. I don't own it. And I'm going to be leaving here someday, and I'm not taking it with me. It's his stuff. I'm here to take care of it, right? So somebody calls, trucks broke down in Virginia. Oh, well, God, what do you want to do with your truck? You know, it's not my problem. It's his, but, but he tells me what to do. So anyway, it's, uh, it takes a lot of the pressure off if you look at life in a different way sometimes. Um, I still worry. I still wake up at four in the morning, three in the morning, thinking, oh, we got to do this. How's that going to get done? And so I haven't been able to let go of it all yet, but I'm trying. <laughs> so anyway, so we grew from two hives to thousands. I think we run 7,000 hives and 7,000 nukes, so 14,000. Uh, we started selling at a farm market one case at a time, and now we, you know, we're selling pallets daily almost sometimes. Uh, I started out with a wooden barrel on my kitchen. I made an extractor out of an old wooden barrel with a drill on top and I extracted on the kitchen table and now our extracting system will do 45 barrels a day. Hand loaded semis, trucks. I, I remember me, me and one of the guys, Bill, that was in the honey packing. We were someplace and we, we set it we picked up a double, we put it on the bed of the truck, and we didn't realize there was a thin layer of ice, and we let go, and we just couldn't believe that this double was sliding across the truck. And we didn't run over, we just stood there like, <laughs> and it hit the ground, and we're going, well, why didn't we run over and catch it? I don't know. It was just, just crazy stuff, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't miss hand-loading the semi, that's for sure. Um, you know, bobcats and hummerbees. We started out with bobcats. And uh, I think we got seven bobcats, four hummer bees, two track loaders. So we don't pick anything up by hand anymore if, if we don't have to. In fact, I have to yell at the guys sometime. They'll be in there with a pallet of supers, putting supers on, and they'll be taking them from here to the back of the room. I said, we got a machine. What are we doing? You know, don't, that's why we buy the machines, you know, so you guys don't got to work so hard. We want, we could do more, not if you're running back and forth, so. So we have uh, started with me and, I guess it was me and Bill in the beginning until Karen came, and then it was three of us, and then uh, over 40 people in five separate divisions. So, and we're just being blessed by God every day. So it's been great. So that was the pollination, right? No, that was... That's pretty much everything. You're just okay. All right. <laughs> So when they said I was going to be the keynote speaker, it's like, oh, man, what is a keynote speaker? So I said, oh, I hope the people enjoy what I say. They'll say, never go to him again. 
anyway, just you know, moving the equipment line from we've we've extracted in three different buildings. This is the second one that we set up. This was up around Kanajahari where we bought a old cheese plant. We used to have housing for the guys and we would extract there. Um, then we would bring the honey from the St. Lawrence to there to extract. Now, now all the honey goes to Oxford, so much easier. This was a little hot room we had up there. That's the warehouse when, when, where we bottle and that's our honey stand there. So, and this was uh, a long time coming, right Karen? I think. So this was our new building, a little over 13,000 square feet. So I think at this point we figured we were going to be in it for a while. So that's our extracting room. So that's uh, the day the semi came with the Cohen equipment, the 120 frame extracting system. That's kind of a bird's eye view. I think that was your, from your drone, Octavio, right? Yeah, Octavio's got a drone. You've probably seen Octavio stuff. If you look on TikTok or Facebook, Octavio Ruben Vasquez, all kinds of videos, beautiful stuff. So but then we've got our last uh, endeavor. Not our, not our, this is, there's going to be more, but this is our last one that we started. But this is with Lindsay as our partner. This is Cutix Everything Bees. It's a store. Um, this is our, our bee, bee aquarium, and uh, those, there's 10, 10, five high observation hives. They're two frames deep, so there's actually, it's actually a single in the wall. Um, you walk in and you're just surrounded by bees, so it's pretty cool, pretty cool. So my grandson, who doesn't like bees, he's in there, you know, and he's heard us talking stuff, and and he's, we had a group of people there or something, and he's saying, see that bee, that bee there, she's doing the waggle dance, and he'll go like this, you know. And then he says, oh, this one's, he says to grab somebody, there's a bee with pollen, then he'll grab somebody else, there's the queen. And he just, it's like, where did all that come from? You know, that he knows all that, he gets so excited about it in there. So that was another great thing for a grandfather to see his grandson do that kind of stuff. So then we, then we decided we were going to build pollinator gardens, right? What's next? So I got my son-in-law. He's landscape, nursery landscape guy. So he came down. He put in uh, a pond up above, a pond in the, bo in the bottom, and a little creek that runs down through. So that's, this is him starting to build that. And uh, whenever we have, we like parties. And, and our kids all get there. And they're always just down there catching frogs. And then they come back up there wet. But they have so much fun catching frogs. It's, it's just great for kids there. They love the gardens. And then uh, this is, uh, this project kind of got me in a little hot water. This, this is gonna be, this is the old Shenango Canal. That's the bottom of the canal, straight down through there. To the left is the towpath. To the right is our gardens. And I, somehow I got it in my head I wanted a butterfly garden. Well, we're building a house, and we're in South Carolina, and there's a lot of work to do on the house yet. And I come north, and I start my, <laughs> my, my next crazy dream. And then my wife goes, you know, you're working there all the time, but I thought you were going to work on the house. You were excited about working on the house. I said, well, I'll get back to the house, which I have, but sometimes you just need a break from stuff. And I'm a starter. <laughs> It's probably a curse, but I'm a starter. I, I need, I don't know, I hope you're a finisher, but <laughs> you better be. So anyway, these are just some pictures from our, our pollinator garden. So and then we, we do, uh, that was a party last year. Um, we celebrated my wife's birthday, and we uh, re-upped our marriage vows, I guess. Is a, what, and uh, so... My little grandson, um, Karen's sons, um, he goes, Grandma, when are the fireworks going to go, you know? She says, I don't think there's going to be fireworks. He says, yeah, no, there's not going to be fireworks. And with that, they had a firework that said happy birthday, and that started up, and she was surprised. So, 
So that was kind of the ending of it there. It was a lot of fun. We have fun at our parties. So, all right, where are we on this one? This oh. Is a surprise for you, I think. oh, yeah, I haven't seen this one. So you better talk about it. Just so. different things that we get to do from school tours to talking to, you know, senators that may have some power as far as what happens within our industry, um, agriculture, um, employment and things like that. Mm -hmm. EAS down there at the bottom. Oh yeah. Did were any of you at the EAS last year? Was it a good did you come over to our place? Oh yeah. Well, well good party. Oh there you go. It was a good party, huh? Oh, we had like 250. I think there was, I think there, somebody said there was 500, but I don't, I don't know. But uh, our guys did a, I think we did what, three goats, Octavio? Yeah. No, not goats, sheep. Yeah, one, one hog and three sheep. And they, they cook it in a pit underground and oh, it was, it was great. Then we had fireworks at that one too. Yeah, so. PBS came and, and talked. So we get to do a lot, of, a lot of really cool things. Yeah. So this, this here is Senator Ramos from, from New York. She was up. She was the one that was pushing for overtime hours for ag workers. And we kind of had her come up to our farm to show her. I thought Octavia would have more pull, but he didn't. Um, um, trying to explain to her that, you know, we really, it's going to be hard on, on agriculture in New York to have overtime hours because uh, we're competing against states that don't, you know, and, and we're with a commodity. It's not like they say, oh, just raise your prices. Well, you can't with a commodity. So and then uh, anyway, and beautiful picture. That brings us to a break. A break. Do you want a five minute break or you want to keep going?